puede cambiar al inglés ahora. Eh, así que los que necesiten conectarse, por favor, eh, conéctense. So, uh, welcome, Professor Bowles. Um, the way we're, we're going to do this is I'm briefly going to give some context about your work. Then you're going to do your presentation, a brief presentation, and then we're going to open up for questions uh, from the audience. If anyone, when, they, when we start the questions, feels more comfortable making the question in Spanish, go ahead. I'll help the translation if we, are, we get into trouble, uh, so, so don't worry about that. Um, in addition to what the Dean said about Professor Bowles, I wanted to point out that one of the main characteristics uh, that uh, one can see in his work if one follows it is a combination of a constant critical perspective on contemporary capitalism combined with very rigorous economic research. And th this, this combination is not as frequent as we would like, actually, in economics. So that's, that's very important. I think um, most of you who, haven't, uh, who are just starting your uh, careers as economists, as researchers, should actually read uh, most of uh, what uh, Professor Bowles has, uh, has written. I just wanted to point you in a direction with that. Um, I brought with me three books that I want to, uh, I want to introduce you to. The, one, the first one I want you to, to know about is uh, the, I would say, graduate level microeconomics books, this one, Microeconomics, Behavior, Institutions, and Evolution. I think, well, this is a book I've, I've read, I've been using for a long time in graduate teaching. I think it's a very balanced approach. It's not a, it doesn't have one perspective or, or the other. It, it's a very balanced approach to microeconomics, to modern microeconomics, um, the microeconomics of market failures, of state failure as well, uh, of political economy, the real world sort of economics that we live in. A, a very good news about this is that our colleagues at the Universidad de los Andes, Colombia, translated it to Spanish and it is available for free uh, as a PDF in some website, if you put down the name and uh, his name, you'll find it and you can download it. Uh, so, so you can read it in Spanish. Uh, if you can read it in English, I think it's better. Uh, the other book I wanted to, to, to show you is this book called Understanding Capitalism. This is a collaboration between Professor Bowles and two other um, economists, Richard Edwards and Frank Roosevelt, uh, uh, that on, on it's an attempt to, to make a different, uh, a new and a more modern, a, a better uh, undergrad introductory to economics book. It has macro and microeconomics. Um, I think that, that this, is a, this is a great step forward because as most of us know, some of the introductory courses are not that balanced and, have, and include some perspectives that aren't uh, adequately, uh, don't, doesn't have enough caveats maybe. Uh, in some of the books. So I think this is, a, this is a very important book that you people should be aware of. You should also be aware that Professor Bowles is involved in an initiative with other economists on reformulating uh, the economics curriculum, uh, particularly in microeconomics, but also in macroeconomics. So probably in the future, we're gonna have some new undergrad books uh, authored by him that uh, we're, we're, we're uh, uh, waiting very anxiously to see them. Uh, I want to publicly, uh, um, um, recognize the, the willingness of uh, Sam. He's, uh, as you all know, we're, well, most of you know, we're involved in a curricular reform here in the University of Chile. So he's agreed to meet with students and professors and discuss uh, what is missing in the curriculum and how we can uh, introduce these other uh, subjects. And finally, I would like to uh, introduce you to one of his more recent, I don't know if it's the most recent, it's the most recent uh, book um, that, um, that um, uh, is called The New Economics of Inequality and Redistribution by Cambridge University Press. Uh, this is a very, very good book. I highly recommend it. Uh, myself, as a teacher, I've, in the, in the Master in Public Policy program, I told you this yesterday, um, and uh, starting from the work made by Joe Stiglitz, um, we try to teach the idea that market failure 
is a critical place to understand the problems of growth and productivity together with inequality. Uh, that this is related and that, the, that, that, that one has to understand market failure and also agency problems, that, the, that is um, uh, political economy, to understand how these things are related and why they're so difficult to solve. And the literature uh, on these subjects is actually there and has been there for some time. Uh, uh, agency, uh, contract theory, uh, negotiation, uh, all these subjects have been treated. But there's been a couple of attempts to put them together in a concise way and, uh, and they, they, haven't, they haven't been as successful as one would expect. I believe, having reading this book, that this one is very successful. So I highly recommend the, uh, this, uh, the reading of this book. Um, and just to introduce the subject, or, or, which Sam is going to uh, talk about, which is the relationship with, between uh, uh, justice and productivity or uh, economic development and growth, I just wanted to, to basically, I'm going to read to you a little bit, very short, to sort of make you take a taste of what this is about. So I'm going to read from the preface of this book, the first pages. And Sam asks him the following question. Is egalitarianism passé? Has it passed? He says, I think not. Surprisingly, two reasons to doubt the prevailing equality pessimism come from economics. From economics. It's not from somewhere else. From within economics. The first is the demise of the self-interested homo economicus as the reigning behavioral model in economics brought down by the onslaught of experimental and other evidence showing that people willingly share even when big money is at stake and that they avidly punish those who treat others unfairly even if they have to pay in order to do this. And here he quotes his work with Herbert Guinness. The fact that large fractions of experimental subjects exhibit what are termed social preferences, including altruism, reciprocity, and even inequality aversion invites a reconsideration not only of the political feasibility of egalitarian policies, but also of the economic feasibility of cooperative production and other institutional alternatives. The second reason to question pessimism is a revolution in economic theory of contracts, and here he cites Stiglitz and Lafont. Economics have sidelines the one's conventional assumption that contracts and markets are complete, meaning that everything that is transacted in exchange is specified in a contract that is enforceable at no cost to the exchanging parties. This, this seemingly technical adjustment in economic theory led inexorably to big changes in the take-home me uh, message, that is that where it really matters, Adam Smith's invisible hand is broken. These two, these two new developments, the first about what people are like and the second about how people interact, have far-reaching ramifications. And then he uh, makes the pitch that this book is going to explain how it's related. And I think that the, the talk he's going to give us will introduce us to this perspective, which is a modern perspective on economics. Uh, I will say a few things, but I want to begin by thanking the students of the University of Chile for inviting me to this very exciting uh, development. Uh, now I have to find my... Uh, I, I find this conference very exciting because I have been involved all of my life since I started teaching a very long time ago in trying to transform the curriculum in economics. Uh, sometimes we have made a bit of progress and sometimes we have been blocked. Today, the opportunities for changing how we teach economics, how we learn, uh, are better than they have ever been before. And it's for you to carry forward that mission of making economics something which can uh, be a kind of knowledge that can serve the people to make this world a better place, as our introducers have said. Um, but I also want to thank the students of Chile, not just from this university, because you, all of you, have put on the table for discussion the issues of poverty, inequality, education, the quality of life, which have really been absent 
from economics for far too long. Uh, these are things which we are thankful for, all of us, including those who have been professors in this field for so long, and we feel really quite like you have opened the door for a lot of discussions which we have needed. Um, <coughs> I'll begin also by thanking my co-authors. There are a very large number of them. Uh, I want to thank also the Behavioral Sciences Program at the Santa Fe Institute. The MacArthur Foundation, uh, 20 years ago, decided uh, to invest a significant amount of research funds in studying the costs of inequality. And uh, they put together a research uh, group of 20 people uh, to study why, uh, why inequality might be a problem for development instead of a necessity of development. Uh, and finally, I want to thank a great many co-authors. Uh, almost all of my work is co-authored. I, I think working in teams is the way to do good science, and uh, that's what I do. Uh, let me begin by reviewing uh, with the direction that I'll be taking in this talk. Uh, I'll use the expression, the uh, efficiency equality trade-off, and there you see a picture of this thing which probably appears in every economics textbook, something like this, where we can have equality or we can have efficiency, but we cannot have both. Uh, <clears throat> now, interestingly, if you study microeconomic theory, you'll find there's a bit of schizophrenia about the subject of the trade-off, because uh, the fundamental theorem of welfare economics and the Coase theorem asserts that as far as wealth is concerned, we can support efficient outcomes, whatever the wealth distribution. However, the efficiency equality trade-off says something quite different. It says, if you have a highly equal wealth distribution, you must necessarily have an inefficient economy. I think the difference in focus is one between the high theory, more or less the priests of economics, as opposed to the practitioners, the policy makers, and so on. I'll have something to say about the neutrality of wealth equality. Then I want to say something more about empirical studies. Because, uh, as you know, in the last 20 years, we've really revised our knowledge about the trade-off. Then I want to begin uh, looking at the new economics uh, that Oscar has just uh, introduced. First, I'll talk about behavioral economics. Then I'll talk about contract theory. And I will use these two ideas from behavioral economics and contract theory to talk about the burden of inequality. Uh, and I'll show you how this burden really weighs heavily on the US economy and the economies of many countries in Europe. And finally, in closing, I want to talk about the future. I want to talk about the economy of knowledge, the economy in which we will have to do things differently in order to do well. Uh, and we'll have to learn how to cooperate in a knowledge-based economy. And I'll talk a bit about the kinds of policies which might be necessary in order to do that. Uh, now, let's talk about the, uh, the conventional wisdom. As I said, um, the fundamental theorem of welfare economics has a simple statement. It says, competitive uh, interaction between buyers and sellers supports a efficient outcome, a Pareto efficient outcome, irrespective of the initial distribution of wealth. Uh, and secondly, the so-called Coase theorem, it's not a theorem actually, it's a very interesting paper. Uh, the Coase theorem says more or less the same thing. It says, if you have efficient bargaining, uh, then irrespective of the distribution of property, you'll have an efficient outcome. And of course, the word efficient in both cases means Pareto efficient. That is, it's an outcome in which no one can be made better off without someone being made worse off. Now, uh, if you turn to public economics, development economics, the popular press, the talking heads on TV, they'll tell you a different story. They don't tell you that it doesn't matter, the distribution of wealth. We can have efficiency no matter how equal or unequal. They'll tell you that we have a trade-off. Unfortunately, they say, if we want to pursue equality, it's going to be a costly mission. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they then show us a figure like this. Now, the critical questions are the following. Uh, when this kind of graph is shown in a textbook, it said, well, basically, we're at point B. And if, uh, if we move to point C, we suffer inefficiency loss. But they don't ask, 
How do we know that we're on the frontier? Maybe we're at point A here, in which we could move to point D. Uh, now, that's a possibility which I think needs to be explored. Of course, every economy has its inefficiencies. And I want to suggest something which I think is very important for public policy. Many of the efficiencies of an advanced capitalist economy are there because of inequality, because of inequality. And removing the inequality is part of the solution. It's not part of the problem. Uh, now, OK, here's, so here's a quiz. What will you find in every introductory textbook but cannot be found in reality? And of course, you think maybe unicorns. But no, the answer is not unicorns. The answer is the efficiency equality trade-off. Uh, I can assure you, you'll find it. By the way, even in a textbook by Joe Stiglitz, who changed the way we think about economics, you'll find even in his textbook uh, a efficiency equality trade-off. It's more or less the kind of thing which every economist must swear to. I mean, religions have all of these sort of symbols to which they swear. And in economics, it seems to be the efficiency equality trade-off. However, even in the 80s, there were some early warning signs that maybe this particular unicorn did not exist. People began to compare the very rapid economic growth of the East Asian economies with the rather slower growth of most Latin American economies, along with the facts that the East Asian economies were highly equal, both in wealth distribution and particularly income distribution, compared to the Latin American economies. And that comparison began to make its way into public policy documents. Uh, then, of course, there were a series of famous econometric papers uh, published in top journals, which essentially made the argument that to the surprise of economics, inequality is bad for growth. Uh, now, I've never been very impressed with the econometric evidence, to tell you the truth, uh, b because they're mostly cross-sectional evidence. But what we really would like to know is, suppose we're in a particular country, Chile today. Suppose we make a change so that we have a more equal distribution of wealth or of income. What will be the consequences? That's a historical question. It's a dynamic question. It's not a question which you can easily answer looking at a cross-section. You probably should look at some countries that adopted a new policy. And then what happened? Well, it's very hard to do. I think those of you who are studying econometrics know that I'm talking about what's called an identification problem. We need somehow to have a shock, like an equality shock, and then see what happened. Well, you know, we did have a bit of an equality shock. In the advanced capitalist countries, after the Second World War, there was the, uh, uh, the development of the welfare state, the recognition of trade unions, and there was really an entirely new capitalism which came out of the Second World War and the Great Depression. And so I put before you some data. Here we have growth rates, and here we have investment, and here we have uh, 1820 to 1870, uh, and so on. This graph here is the post-World War II period. Now look at that graph. The golden age of capitalism was the age of trade unions and the welfare state by, by double. That's what made capitalism work well. Unprecedented growth in the era of the powerful trade unions and the welfare state. Now, what are you going to say about that? I don't know. Many people say it's because of the trade unions and because of the welfare state that we had this growth. I'm not entirely convinced that it's a causal argument in the way it's put. I honestly don't know. I've studied this for decades, and I, still do, I can't really say that I know that it's causal. But I can tell you one thing for sure. Having powerful trade unions and having a welfare state did not eliminate the possibility of rapid growth. It coincided with it. And perhaps it played a causal role. Now, let's look at some aspects of the new economics. The, the death of the equality efficiency trade-off, empirically, it coincided with some fantastic new developments in economics. Uh, and, uh, the first is the uh, behavioral revolution, uh, which challenged the axioms of self-interest by actually looking and asking people, what do they do? This is something which has been long insisted on by, other, by some economists, 
Uh, Herbert Simon, for example, long insisted that we should not posit a utility function, we should actually look at human motivation. Well, finally, in the 80s and 90s, we started to do this. And th the answer that we found was really shocking. We were looking for homo economicus. Now, he, it's a he, by the way, I'm sure it's he. He, uh, he, he was not exactly a unicorn, uh, because we found some. I'll tell you where we found them also. Not economics majors, by the way. Uh, we found a few of these homo economicuses. But they were outnumbered by other people with rather different motivations. Uh, let me start with one of the sort of iconic uh, experiment, the ultimatum game. Uh, probably many of you have heard about the ultimatum game. It's the following. Uh, uh, say, I am the experimenter, and I give to Oscar ten uh, uh, $100. And I tell him he provisionally has this, uh, uh, but he has, to, uh, um, he has to offer uh, to somebody else, one of you, uh, some portion of the hundred. And he offers it to you, and then you can either accept or reject. If you accept, suppose he offers you 50. Okay, you say, okay. Then you go home with 50 in your pocket, and the same for him. But probably he'll push it a little harder than that. He may offer you 20. And if you say, mm, no, I'm not accepting 20, then he goes home with zero, and you go home with zero. That's why it's called an ultimatum game. Uh, OK, everybody think about game theory and think about backward induction. He's the first mover. And he knows that you're selfish. And he's selfish. OK, so homo economicus around, all around. What will he offer? One dollar because he'll accept $1 because he's selfish. And he'll offer the smallest possible amount to get a, a, a positive offer, right? OK, it never happens. Never. We've done this hundreds of times, hundreds of experiments, in at least, I think, 57 countries now. And it never happens. Uh, people typically offer uh, 50%. That's the modal offer. The average of many studies around the world is you offer about 42% and they're accepted. Offers less than 20% are typically rejected. Okay, so you think, wow, that's really great. People are offering half. They're really generous. No, you're not thinking straight. They may be just being careful. The news here is not that people offer 50%. The news is that people reject big offers. I could be offering you, say, 40%, because I don't want you to say no. What's really big news is when somebody's offered $20, and they say, no way, I'm not accepting it. That's news. Because that person just paid $20 for the pleasure of punishing this guy because he was so selfish. Now, think about that. We found this around the world. We found it in the Amazon. We have found it in, uh, in Africa among hunters and gatherers. We found it in Mongolia with herders. We found it with economic students, I'm proud to say. People hate injustice. And they're willing to pay to punish the people who try to impose an unjust outcome on others. They do it all the time. They do it in every country, every culture. Uh, now, that's, I think it's good news. It's incredibly inspiring. I mean, we shouldn't be so surprised, after all, if we look around us and ask, what do people do when they're treated unjustly? They, don't, they usually do something about it. So what have we found out? Well, there are a number of new motivations that have now come. They're, they're really prominent in economic discussions. What's called inequality aversion, which you've already heard about, is exactly what it means. Uh, uh, reciprocity. I treat you OK if you treat me OK. That's going on in the ultimatum game. Uh, altruism, just unconditional concern for some other person. Uh, and finally, self-interest. Self-interest is surely a very important economic motive. It's definitely there. But as I say, if you look at these other motives in experiments, those who are consistently self-interested are always less than half and usually less than one-third. So homo economicus is outnumbered. Let's turn to <coughs> contracts. Uh, uh, the place where contract pr 
problems first appeared uh, is, of course, in credit markets. Uh, and when we say we're talking about a complete contract, uh, from the quote that was read, we know what it means is that if I'm exchanging with you something, it means everything you care about and everything I care about is in the contract and we do not need to enforce it. If, if I'm exchanging something with you and you don't give your part of it, what do I do? I call the cops. I don't have to do anything. I appeal to a third party that's going to enforce the contract on you. Now, of course, that's a fiction. It works for grocery shopping. Maybe that's why grocery shopping plays such a large role in economics textbooks. But it doesn't work for the credit market. OK, I borrow $100,000 from you, and I say, I've got this fantastic project. And then it turns out I administer this thing in a rather, uh, let's say, risky way. And I end up losing everything. And then there's a contract that says, I am supposed to pay you $110,000 next year. What happens? I don't pay you, because I'm broke. Uh, and there's no way that you can force me to pay. That's what's called limited liability. Uh, and that's just part of the problem. You also, suppose uh, I said, I've got this great project. It's a machine, and it can run really fast, or it can run moderately. And uh, you say, oh, and you're the banker. You say, OK, listen, Sam, I'll lend you the money, but you can't run the machine fast, because it may blow up. But you can't control how I set the dial because you can't observe how I'm administering this thing. Uh, and so uh, in the credit contract, uh, we have incomplete contracts because the promise to repay is not enforceable. Now, when that's the case, we have found through the research of Joseph Stiglitz, through the research which I've done in my microeconomics book, uh, and through other people's research, uh, the following findings. They're very important. Those without wealth are excluded. They just can't borrow. Those who have a modest amount of wealth can borrow, but they have to pay more interest, and their projects have to be better, and their projects have to be smaller than, in a, than a, another person who is much wealthier. Think about it. What does it mean? Well, what it means is there's some very good projects, some good ideas that are in the minds and in the hands of people without wealth, and they cannot implement them because they can't borrow the money. And there's some other projects in the hands of people of modest wealth that they can only implement on a small scale because they have modest wealth. Well, you don't have to be an economics major to know that cannot possibly be efficient because you're excluding from the credit market a lot of good projects and forcing people with good projects to operate them on a small scale if they lack the wealth. Now, let's think about the labor market. Similar problems occur. The problem in the labor market is, well, I shouldn't, it gives you the answer. In, in 1914, Henry Ford doubled wages at one of his plants and shortened the hours. So the, the, I mean the, he doubled the daily wage and he shortened the hours. Uh, you probably heard about it, Ford's $5 day. His competitors thought he was crazy until he beat them in competition. Now, why did he do that? People said, oh, well, maybe he had a labor supply problem. No, no. When the reporters went to the factory to hear about this crazy guy who doubled his wage, they couldn't hardly get into the factory because there were so many workers outside the factory trying to get a job. So he didn't have the, it wasn't that he was lacking a supply of labor. Uh, uh, he did it because he understood that if you pay people well, they'll work hard. They'll stick around. Uh, and that's something, Henry Ford knew it. Uh, it took economists another half a century or more to discover it. Actually, Herbert Simon, who was a guy who I just mentioned, he understood it, but nobody paid any attention in 1950 when he wrote about it. Uh, the incomplete contract here is, is uh, it's not exactly the same as the credit market. If you hire me to do a job, what have you bought? You didn't buy my work. You didn't buy my effort. You purchased the right to order me to do things. You purchased a political right. You rented my autonomy for a period of time, and then you can order me to do stuff. Whether I do it, of course, depends on 
the kind of structure of discipline which you can impose in the workplace. And that includes monitoring me, watching me with supervisors, with TV cameras or whatever. It also includes paying me a decent wage like Henry Ford did. Uh, now we have here results. Uh, a result of this is that in the Nash equilibrium, in a competitive economy, by the way, this is with no trade unions, the, no so-called imperfections. In the Nash equilibrium of an economy like this, employers spend significant amounts of resources on monitoring the TV cameras and the supervisors that I mentioned. Uh, it's also true that both the wages and the work effort will be too low, too low in the precise sense that if there was some way to increase wages and to increase effort, it would be a Pareto improvement. Both the worker and the owner would be better off. But there's no way to do it. So that's why the Nash equilibrium is inefficient. Another way to summarize this is uh, too much stick, not enough carrot. That is a characteristic of all of these disciplinary strategies in a Nash equilibrium in a competitive economy. Uh, now, how can you address this? Well, notice, if the workers working in this factory, if they owned the, the, uh, the firm, uh, then they would monitor each other. And remember, the workers have the information about who's coming late and who isn't working properly. So they would have a superior monitoring technology. They would be able to do better than the boss uh, because they would be the ones to benefit if everybody worked hard and well. And why can't you do that? Think back two slides to the credit market. Remember, the workers can't borrow money, or they can't borrow very much. They certainly can't borrow the $100,000 or the $120,000 that is necessary to equip yourself with the average capital per worker in the US economy. No way in the world they could borrow that much. So they can't be owners. So the ownership option is precluded by wealth inequality. We do know that a work ethic, a sense of obligation, or maybe reciprocity with the owner, that can help. But it doesn't work if the inequality is so great in the firm that the workers are resentful because they consider the wage to be unfair. So inequality makes it impossible to solve the problem of work effort and particularly, this, is a, this is particularly the case if you have not the production of automobiles, which you can observe pretty carefully what's happening as the, as the car passes in front of the worker and he does whatever thing he does on the car. It becomes extremely important in the service sector, in delivering care to the elderly, in operating a restaurant, uh, in doing research, in writing software. These are all things in which it's absolutely impossible to include in the contract what it is that the owner cares about. So let's look at the burden of inequality. I call guard labor the kind of work that is imposing the rules on people. But first, I want to, seeing that I mentioned Pareto, of Pareto efficiency and so on, but a lot of people don't like Pareto because they don't think Pareto efficiency is a very good moral standard. But Pareto was a very brilliant economist. Listen to him here. He says, the efforts of men are utilized in two different ways. They are directed to the production or transformation of economic goods, that's what's in the textbook, uh, or else to the appropriation of goods produced by others. That's to getting a larger share of the pie, even if you get a big slice by making the pie shrink. Pareto was really attuned to that problem, the aspect of conflict. But listen even better to John Stuart Mill, earlier than Pareto. He said, it's lamentable to think how great a portion of all efforts and talent in the world are employed in merely neutralizing one another. It is the proper end of government to reduce this wretched waste to the smallest possible amount by taking such measures as shall cause the energies now spent by mankind in injuring one another or in protecting themselves against injury, to be turned to the legitimate employment of the human faculties. And I say, right on, that is exactly correct. Now, let's think about guard labor. What is it? Guard labor is the labor which is devoted 
to reproducing the status quo, to reproducing the power relationships and institutions which define our human relationships today. So these are, uh, 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 these are unproductive workers. They're not making things happen. They're very, very necessary. I'm not suggesting we should just dispense with them. Uh, uh, my son-in-law is a prison guard. So my son-in-law and my grandson is a Marine. So they're engaged in guard labor. Uh, and uh, when I talk about my son-in-law's work, I visit him often in the prison, actually. I know that his work is essential and important. So that's not the issue. The question is, why do we need so many prison guards? That's the question. Now let's think about guard labor in America. What you see here is a time series. We have de a definition of all of the kinds of guard labor. We have my son-in-law, prison guards. We have cops. We have security personnel. We have the armed forces. I also include here supervisors, because the, the supervisors at work, the ones who are making, you, making sure you're fulfilling the contract or trying to make sure of this, they could be considered to be work cops. These are the people who are enforcing the terms of that contract or attempting to do so. By now, you've looked at the figure. Isn't that amazing? That's one quarter of the American labor force is engaged in just enforcing the status quo, not in producing anything. That's more than we have employed in manufacturing. That's more than produce investment goods in America. Reproducing the status quo is one of the most largest claims on resources in America today. And of course, it's way up from uh, uh, the early, earlier days. Uh, um, now, why do we spend so much on guard labor? Well, here I look at guards. I'm, here I'm not talking about this large category of guards. I'm talking about guards. The guys with uniforms, the private security personnel, the guys who you see all over the place in urban America. Uh, these are not police, these are guards. Uh, and we're looking at how many are there? Private security personnel. This is a measure of inequality. This is a measure of guards. And you can see some of the cities. Uh, uh, notice that the simple correlation is almost 0.7. And you have a few places like Milwaukee and Greensboro with uh, uh, little inequality and all, very little guard labor. Places here which, of course, are famous. They're famous for uh, crime and they're famous for inequality. And um, after today, they'll be famous for guard labor also. Uh, let's look at social spending across countries in Europe. Uh, so here we have uh, the uh, average social sector and welfare spending. And here we have guard labor. And uh, here we have, of course, a negative correlation. The countries that spend a lot on welfare and social spending don't spend very much on guard labor. So you get the idea? Social spending and guard labor are substitutes, right? Substitutes. Th think of an isoquant if you want, right? Just think of an isoquant. You have guard labor here, social spending here. And suppose we have combinations of social spending and guard labor that will keep things OK, you know, keep things quiet. Well, this is an isoquant. And they, uh, uh, if you have more of one, you have less of the other. More social spending, fewer guards. Uh, now, what do I conclude from this? Uh, well, first, I'd like you to think about the general point here. We have a distribution of wealth. That affects what governance structures we can have. If we have highly unequal wealth distribution, we cannot have worker-owned firms. That's the example which I've given. If we have highly unequal wealth distribution, then we have to have maintaining our peace uh, by guards. Both of these produce productivity and distribution of economic opportunity here. Uh, so this is the causal structure. An arrow means a cause. Uh, so the logic is how we govern ourselves depends on the kinds of wealth inequality that we have. And we have examples now of ways which, in which we could change ways in which we could open up the set of possible governance structures to increase our possible productivity. There are some examples. Of course, we can talk about them. Uh, the worker ownership of firms could be made uh, much easier to undertake. 
borrowing for productive uses by poor and middle income families could be made easier. Higher, educa uh, higher quality education for everyone is an asset, and that could be also equalized. Uh, we could abolish intellectual property rights, which would also be an asset, an egalitarian asset redistribution. All of these would be productivity enhancing. Uh, I'm quite convinced, I'd be happy to talk with you about any of the examples. Uh, now, so here's the idea. And this is kind of the abstract economic theory. I've given you lots of examples. I ask you to bear with me in this slide and the next one. This is just theory. The first idea is this. This is like a proposition, where actions taken by agents cannot be subjected to contracts. Uh, property rights should assign residual claimancy, be the ultimate owner, over the income streams and the asset values. These should go to the people uh, who uh, are doing the things in which you cannot write a contract. So for example, in a firm, it's the workers who are doing the stuff that is the effort that you cannot, cannot contract for. Let them be the ones who benefit or lose if the job is not well done. The same is true with farms. Uh, let the farmer who farms the land be the one who owns the crop, because then he or she is going to benefit by a job well done. That's the basic principle, and it comes out of all of these principal agent models. Uh, now, uh, it's not efficient, or even possible in many cases, to let the worker be the residual claimant on the income stream of the firm, unless the worker is also the owner of the machinery and the, the capital equipment in the firm. Why is that? Well, suppose the workers, a single worker, a group of workers, suppose they own the income stream but they don't own the machines. What will they do to the machines? They won't maintain them. They'll, no, they'll run them down. Uh, the only way to have an incentive compatible redistribution is to redistribute the assets when you redistribute the residual claimancy. So wealth distribution is necessarily involved. Now, suppose there's some asset and it would be better owned by a super rich guy just because for example, the, rich, the super rich guy doesn't care about risk. And this is an asset in which it's very important a guy should be risk neutral. The rich guy should own it. A person of modest wealth wouldn't, wouldn't operate it well because they would be too risk averse. Fine, the rich guy can buy it. Here the Coase theorem is correct. In this case, the rich guy will buy it because it's worth more to him than it is to a guy of modest income. However, what, I'm, what I've explained to you is there are many, many cases in which the, the person who would be the best owner of the asset is not rich. It's a worker, it's a farmer. In order for those people to be the residual claimants, you have to redistribute wealth. And that can be only done by government intervention to redistribute the wealth. It won't happen in the market. Now, um, I'm going on for too long, aren't I? You're being too, no, 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 I won't take 10 minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's very dangerous. You should never ask a professor to speak, you know, because we're used to, we only, we only speak in 55 minute segments. Uh, okay, I'll finish very quickly. Uh, uh, the rationale, here is a strategy which I call productivity enhancing egalitarian asset redistribution. Okay, maybe it's not a good slogan yet. It has to be simplified somehow, but uh, you, you get the idea. Here's the rationale. You give residual claimancy to the people who are doing the things which cannot be contracted, the farmer, the worker, and so on. Uh, this will facilitate trust and consensus building in the workplace, in the factory, in the office, and so on. Uh, this will mean that people will have a way of sharing the gains from an exchange, and you won't have, the pe you won't have somebody saying to Oscar, go to hell, I won't take your 20 bucks. Uh, that's, that's burning money uh, when you have so much conflict that you cannot cooperate. Uh, it will reduce the demand for unproductive guard labor. You can get rid of most of those guards. For example, in the co-ops <coughs> producing uh, plywood, this stuff, uh, in, uh, in the US, they, uh, they, when they were taken over as a co-op from a standard capitalist firm, uh, they, uh, they fired almost all of the supervisors. They just, I mean, they had a few supervisors left. So they were, 
but they vastly cut down the amount of guard labor because they could count on the fellow workers to discipline each other. <coughs> um, now, um, there are some problems. And this is something I think that every egalitarian person, anyone who believes in justice, please think hard about this. I think it is just and I think it will be productive to redistribute assets from the very rich to everybody else. That's what I think we should do. I think there are good economic arguments for it, and needless to say, there are good moral arguments for it. There is one problem. If you redistribute assets to the poor or to the middle income, those people necessarily are going to be risk averse compared to the very rich. They'll, they're going to be unwilling to take some risks. And so by making this redistribution of wealth to the middle income and the lower income people, you're also redistributing decision-making power to people who will be less risk-taking. That's not a good idea. It's not a good idea for a dynamic economy. So a, a challenge to egalitarians is this. Design an economy which is both egalitarian and dynamic. Reconcile innovation with justice. Now, I think it can be done. Finland is one of the most technologically dynamic countries in the world and also one of the most egalitarian. There are plenty of examples of how it can be done, but it does suggest an expanded role for income, uh, for insurance. Uh, I could explain what I mean by that. Uh, so we end up here with uh, a summary. Uh, here we have supply side theories and demand side theories. We have trickle down theories and trickle up theories. I don't know if that's, that, that doesn't exist in English, and I'm sure it doesn't exist in Spanish. Here we have the Washington Consensus, uh, which is a supply-side trickle-down theory. Here we have uh, uh, maybe the leading uh, opponent of the Washington Consensus is trickle-up, uh, sorry, here, wage-led social expenditure, the Keynesian model. Uh, we should accelerate the economy by redistributing income so it will expand aggregate demand. Uh, of course, the Keynesian models don't have to be trickled down. They can be trickled up. Aggregate demand is stimulated by enhancing profits so that the capitalists will spend, or by reducing wages so that exports will expand. So there's nothing in Keynesian economics which commits you to trickle up. It could also be trickled down. This is what I'm advocating here. Productivity enhancing asset uh, redistribution. It's a supply side theory that uh, makes the economy work better, more productive, uh, by in empowering and enhancing the income and livelihoods of the least well-off. Now, that's gone. That's not happening anymore. It's on the cover of textbooks, but it's not happening. That's what's happening. That's the World Wide Web. So when you think about the economy, don't think about factories and farms. Don't think about anything which is producing material goods. Think about what we're doing now, talking. Think about all the people you know who are taking care of their parents or taking care of young children or being a waiter or a waitress in a, uh, in a restaurant, uh, hospital workers and so on. That's where the economy is today. And that's where it's going to be in the future. How are we going to organize that economy? Well, uh, the burden of inequality. It was substantial in the economy of grain and steel. That's what I call it, the economy of grain and steel. It will be much, much larger in the weightless economy based on knowledge. It'll be larger because in this service-based, knowledge-based economy, the stuff that's going around, you can't, you can't hold it in your hand. It's called weightless because you can't weigh it. If you can't weigh it, you can't write a contract in it. You don't know how good the information is until you use it, so you can't buy it according to a contract. Knowledge defies the logic of contracts. Uh, and so the problems that I've mentioned, part of the grain and steel economy, are going to come back and bite us in the information-based economy, much, much more severely. And then what should we learn? Us, the professors who need to retool, and you guys who have the opportunity to read something new. Uh, that's a question that's before this group. I won't say what I, th what I think about it, except I want to pass on this fantastic group at Universidad de los Andes in Bogota. Uh, they, they formed a cooperative. 
Uh, I gave them the property rights. By the way, I do believe in abolishing intellectual property rights. I gave them the property rights to this book, and it's online. That's the URL for that. Uh, and so now, a challenge. What about this one? Uh, I'm happy. I will give away the rights. Or I'll, if necessary, I'll purchase the rights from uh, Cambridge University Press, and I'll give them to any cooperative who would like to translate this and put it online. Uh, so uh, maybe it can happen. Uh, it's up to you or whoever else would like to do it. Thank you very much. Eh, buenas tardes. O sea, buenos días. Eh, quería hacer una pregunta porque eh, eh, lo que dice el profesor a mí me hace harto sentido. Yo desde chico he pensado por qué hay tanto guardia, por qué hay tanta gente que hace cosas improductivas. Pero lo que yo no encontré ningún cuestionamiento de su parte es que acá en, este, en el sistema capitalista la base se sustenta en la competencia. Y por sobre todo en la competencia casi a muerte entre las personas. Entonces yo pienso en un sistema capitalista más avanzado, con un poco de más igualdad, en que todos tengamos las mismas condiciones. Sorry. The, the question was projected so loud that I couldn't hear the question in the translation. But maybe you can just say, say what it yeah, is. I, I, I'll try. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I could only hear a small part of it. So he was asking about the possibility of a more advanced capitalist society with le lower levels of competition, if where competition in, market, in the marketplace doesn't play such an important role. Or if you've mm -hmm. thought about that, because you didn't hear that in your presentation. <coughs> yes, I've, I've thought about. Uh, um, I, I think cooperation is essential to any economy. And if you look at a, a, any economy, but particularly a, a capitalist economy, what do you see? You see huge areas of cooperation, either enforced cooperation or voluntary cooperation. These are, of course, families and firms and so on. They play an important role. Uh, and they also compete. Uh, maybe it will shock you. I think competition among firms is a great thing. If they're a loser, they should lose. Uh, and I think the competition is one of the great things about capitalism, uh, because it eliminates people who fail to do what they're supposed to do, which is to produce high quality goods at low cost. Uh, now, if you can think of some other way to eliminate people who exploit their position and their privileges by producing bad stuff at high cost, I'd be happy to hear about it. But I think one of the great things about capitalism is that it has this more or less automatic way of imposing heavy costs on people who do a bad job as a capitalist. Now, wait a minute. I'm not being utopian. I know that firms who do a bad job stay in business for a long time, often because they have a government license or they have some uh, privilege, monopoly privilege, against which Adam Smith wrote. But when you have competition, I think you have the best available method for the elimination of the losers. Now, I've spent my life living in a town, for example, in which we don't even have a government. We just have meetings. I, I, I'm telling you the truth. In my town, and the town I grew up in, the town I now live in, I live be there because of this. I believe in cooperation. I love the fact that in our town, when we make a decision, we all meet together at the school, and we, 500 people, and we debate. That's how we do it. Uh, so I love cooperation, but I also hate people who stay in business when they're doing a bad job, whether they're a government servant, whether they're a government body, or whether they're a private firm. And I want to find some way to get rid of them. La siguiente pregunta. Le solicitamos que sean breves en la exposición de su pregunta para que pueda participar más gente. Y lo otro es que hablen despacio con el micrófono para que el profesor pueda escuchar la traducción. Bien, cuando uno lee la, la primera sección, la sección de motivación del de libro de teoría de los incentivos de la FONT y Martin Moore, principalmente pone ejemplos sencillos en los cuales en Smith, en Human, Bicray, hay ejemplos, digamos, de problemas de incentivos. Sin embargo, la propuesta un poco es, cuando se piensa en el diseño de mecanismos y principalmente yo pienso en los modelos de votación en tanto uno, ¿cómo puede diseñar 
un mecanismo, si uno entendiera como una institución que va a llevar a un fin deseado, pero que contemple, digamos, toda, toda la gama de situaciones que pueden ocurrir en una sociedad y no solo, digamos, situaciones particulares entre dos individuos que tienen problemas de información asimétrica o incompleta. Y pues particularmente en Colombia, pues trabajo con el profesor Ernesto Cárdenas, que es doctor de Siena, cuando él trabaja los temas de polarización que parten de todo el tema de la inequidad y todas las cosas se complican mucho para tener un para trabajarlo con un modelo de principal agente. Entonces, ¿cómo diseñar un mecanismo general? ¿O cuál sería la propuesta teórica al respecto? Um, uh, thank you for mentioning my former student, uh, a different Cardenas, also from Colombia. Uh, the, um, uh, well, the, the problem that you ask is exactly the right question. And I think uh, the left, I'm a leftist, I've always been a leftist, the left has paid insufficient attention to the problem of mechanism design. Uh, throughout the, my life, I have, I have focused a lot on what, thinking, well, okay, uh, let's try to get rid of capitalism. Uh, and uh, thinking perhaps very naively, I can't believe that I really thought this, that, okay, post-capitalism will be relatively simple. It's an error which Marx made and many leftists made. Uh, somehow, things will take care of themselves. Now, I'm being a bit too self-critical. I, I have studied worker co-ops a lot. Uh, many people have studied uh, socialist enterprise, like your dean, for example, in his doctoral dissertation. Was it your doctoral dissertation? Yes. Uh, uh, so there have been a bunch of studies, but we haven't devoted enough attention to that. Uh, and by the way, I don't think there's a general model of mechanism design for an egalitarian economy. Uh, I know that there's a sort of high priority given in academia to having a more general model. I think the way to do this is to study real cases. Study real cases, like a historian or an anthropologist. Find out what's going on in the co-ops that you know about or in the structures it, which you know about. And then try to develop a model of that thing. Finally, try to figure out how can you make it work better. Uh, but maybe there is a general model, but I'm afraid that if you start with the aspiration of a general model, uh, that it will probably be silly or it won't be very uh, helpful. I, mean, I, I went that route for a while, trying to develop a general model of this, and I failed, and I think I failed for good reasons. But my, my invitation to all of you is, if you find something that you think is working well, a ver or an interesting non-market-based or non-capitalist-based form of organization, study it, be part of it, participate in it, For example, the Occupy Wall Street had extremely interesting ways of allocating resources, extremely interesting ways of mobilizing the information of everyone who was there in the street. Uh, fortunately, it's been studied by a very good economist at Columbia University, Suresh Naidu, whose picture you saw actually uh, there. Suresh was an active participant and he's written a paper about what did we learn about organ organizing uh, society by studying Occupy Wall Street. Uh, I, it's very, very primitive. My response is inadequate. Uh, but I, I would just say, go out and study what's happening, and then see if you can model it some way where you can generalize. Um, me llamó mucho la atención de que uno, uno de los problemas que usted posó era de que, en el fondo, si los trabajadores fueran propietarios ellos mismos de la fábrica, eh, se resolvería de manera más eficiente el problema de agencia. Y, pero los trabajadores no pueden hacer eso porque están excluidos del mercado del crédito. Entonces, me, me llamó la atención si había eh, algún influjo de, de la influencia de, de Proudhon en, en esa propuesta, porque en, en los años 40, eh, Proudhon, el fundador del anarquismo, va a comenzar a, a escribir su escrito sobre economía, y él hace una propuesta llamada el Banco del Pueblo, que básicamente es un banco donde él le va a prestar crédito sin, sin cobrar intereses, a los trabajadores asalariados para que ellos puedan establecer si ser artesano. Y en la visión de Proudhon, el, el artesano, el pequeño propietario, es el hombre que siempre va a ser dueño de su libertad. Entonces, eh, no sé, me gustaría saber si, si recibió algún influjo de Proudhon cuando estaba pensando esta problemática o, o le parece que la propuesta de un banco para el pueblo hoy en día eh, quizás tiene más sentido que apelar a, a una política pública venido desde el Estado, entendiendo que el Estado siempre es un instrumento de clase. Um. Yes, of course, I was influ influenced by Proudhon. Uh, 
but I can't say I was influenced in, in this particular line of research, although probably I, I was. Uh, the idea of a bank uh, which is dedicated to funding worker-owned enterprises is a very good idea. But it's, uh, and obviously, uh, I think zero interest is probably not a very good idea, but a low rate of interest is certainly a good idea. But think what else they could do. Suppose we are a group of workers, uh, and um, then we go to this bank. Uh, and uh, then the bank can, uh, uh, they will know us. If, these, if the bank is a member of the community, they'll know who we are. They'll know whether or not it's likely we have a good idea. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of the Grameen Bank uh, in the third world. In, uh, um, uh, and this is a way of mobilizing information of a community to aid in the assignment of loans. I don't think that workers are any different from anyone else in the fact that they will exploit the possibilities of a loan from a bank to perhaps operate too inefficiently or in, uh, in a risky way or to de deviate in other ways from what would be rational socially. So the, the problem for the, the co-op is, of course, that it's very hard to establish your reputation with the bank unless the, the bank is part of your community of workers. So I think it's an excellent idea. But equally important than a bank, what I mentioned is insurance. Uh, think about insurance. Uh, uh, there are many, many ways in which a society could insure us against things which frighten us. Uh, think about wealth. What's the wealth that most people have? Well, in America, for 80% of the people, what's your wealth? It's your house, the part which the bank doesn't own. It's your house and your car. Again, the part that the bank doesn't own. Uh, that's it. That's what you own. And now, suppose that I have a, a home that's, say, worth $150,000, and I have a car which is worth $15,000 and I'm uh, a uh, welder, and I'm thinking of joining a co-op. Uh, and I'm worrying about my retirement. My retirement is going to be based in large part on the value of my home. I don't know if it's going to be $80,000 or $300,000. And therefore, I'm not going to join the co-op, uh, because the co-op would involve me essentially borrowing a large sum of money to be part of that. Uh, I would not want to expose myself to further risks. I'm already exposed to a lot of risk. That's crazy. We don't have to do it because we could have insurance for home values. Why not? OK, if you insure my home so, uh, against a decline in its value, maybe I wouldn't take care of the home. You know, I wouldn't paint it and keep it nice. Don't do that. Insure my home against home values in my neighborhood. So if the home values in the houses around fall, I get paid. Whatever happened to mine? When I say incentive compatible egalitarianism, that's what I mean. Design an insurance program so that I can't benefit from it, uh, but I will get paid if the housing market collapses. And of course, I'll pay more if the housing market booms. Well, if you can do it with homes, what else? OK, suppose I joined the co-op, and we're making, I don't know, what? Some little things like this. Uh, uh, or, or, you know, suppose we're making some kind of uh, pharmaceutical. And uh, the, this particular thing has a world market price. And the inputs that go into it also have world market prices. My little co-op cannot affect the world market prices. Therefore, you can write an compa uh, incentive-compatible insurance uh, policy for me, for my co-op, which says, if the world market price of the output goes down, I get some payment from the insurance. If it goes up, I pay in. It protects me from the risk. In other words, there are lots and lots of ways that we can protect small co-ops against the risks to which they would otherwise be exposed. Is this utopian? No. It's what happens for farmers in most countries in the world. We already have in America similar insurance programs for small farms. Why? Because we think the small farm is a, is a good way of life. It's the American way, or something. I'm not sure of the reason. But it's some argument like that. Well, if we thought that worker-owned co-ops were also a good part of a democratic society, we could extend the same kind of insurance that now protects farmers from the risks to which they are exposed. We could protect them, too. So in other words, there's a package of policies which could make worker ownership of firms quite possible for maybe half of the economy. 
not for the very capital intensive part and not from the very routine production part where co-op wouldn't have much advantage. But I think you could have a substantial amount of co-ops if you had a, a bank dedicated to that, these kind of insurance programs. And I think we might also have to, it would probably help if we changed our system of education. Uh, at least in America, education for most people, those who are not going on to positions of managerial or leadership positions, is really an education in obedience. Uh, now that's not what you need in a co-op. Everyone in a co-op is a decision maker. So you need an education which rewards independence and creativity. Uh, that's not what we have, not in America. That's re reserved for the top half or the top third. Uh, so, in other words, if you really wanted to have an economy which is egalitarian and dynamic technologically, based on worker-owned co-ops, then there would be a whole range of policies ranging from an education that liberates rather than disciplines to an insurance policy which protects people from risk where you can do that in an incentive compatible way to providing low interest funds. Uh, and I think it would substantially increase the range of democratic experiences which people would have and increase productivity. And what it would mean is any worker in the other part of the economy working for some you know, assembly line production or petrochemicals which will never be made into co-ops, I don't think, they always would have the option of leaving that and going and working for a co-op. And that would put a floor on just how bad things could be in the capitalist firm. Siguiente pregunta. Quien quiera preguntar, levante la mano y le, les pasarán el micrófono. You talk about, a lot about how cooperation is important. Is there any examples of cooperative firms that you would find enlightening that you would like to share with us? Lo puedo decir en español también, sí. No se entendió. Ejemplos de cooperativas que encuentre interesantes y que le gustaría compartir con nosotros. Ejemplos de cooperativas que encuentre particularmente interesantes y que quieran ser conocidos. Creo que The ones which have been best studied, so we can really understand how they work, are a group, the group of plywood firms that uh, 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 in the northwestern part of America. Uh, there are, they are extremely well documented. But I would urge you to read um, the work of Gregory Dow, D-O-W. Uh, he's a very good microeconomist, uh, and he has the best book on uh, worker-owned uh, co-ops, with lots of empirical examples. Uh, The thing to, to, one of the things that, to be worried about is the following. Most things which are called co-ops are not really co-ops. Uh, the, the plywood factories that I'm talking about had a very simple rule. If you worked there, you had to be an owner. And if you were an owner, uh, you, you had to work there. So there were no owners from the outside, and there were no workers there who were not owners. What usually happens in co-ops is a group of rather privileged workers, they form the co-op, uh, and they may be skilled workers, and then they employ people like cleaners or secretaries and so on, just as wage workers. Okay, I mean, maybe it's a little better than an ordinary capitalist firm, but it has a lot of the same features because the cooperative members are now playing the role of capitalist towards these uh, secondary workers. Uh, that's the most common thing which happens because of course there's an incentive uh, for the co-op members Uh, to just employ other people. Why is that? Because suppose I'm going to hire somebody as a, a, a cleaner and the person doesn't have a, a lot of money. Well, I'd like to hire the person and I suppose if the guy could buy a share in the company, then he would be welcome. Then he'd be an owner like me. But if he can't buy a share because he doesn't have the money, then um, I don't want to just make him a member of the co-op because then you have somebody who's a decision maker but who doesn't own the consequences of their decision. Uh, so th those are the kind of problems that, uh, that, that you have. Uh, one of the great things from a macroeconomic standpoint uh, about co-ops is this. If you, if you ask, you know, what are the big differences between co-ops and capitalist firms? There's one. Uh, the co-ops don't fire people over the course of the business cycle. They, they stabilize uh, employment. They'll, they'll adjust hours 
and they'll sometimes just do what's called labor hoarding. Now, th this, this has a very strong impact on stabilization, because essentially these firms are doing their own mini example of Keynesian stabilization by not firing people when demand is slack. And therefore, it minimizes the, the volatility of the business cycle. So an economy made up entirely of co-ops would be less volatile than a similar economy facing similar uh, uh, shocks uh, if it were capitalist. So I mean, that's, that's one thing we know that they really do. Now, of course, that being the case, uh, they bear some costs uh, in doing that. Um, but I think that's one of the, you know, if you look at what are the advantages for the rest of the society, I think the experience of democracy in the firm and the productivity and the egalitarianism, they all count. But so does stabilization. It's a really part of the package. Eh, nos queda tiempo para la última pregunta. Así que quien quiera preguntar, que por favor levante la mano. Buenas. Eh, quería llevar un poco el, el tema al compromiso político del economista. Eh, el tema es que en general eh, la formación del economista es una visión súper directiva del mundo. O sea que eh, yo genero mecanismos para, la, para que las personas actúen como yo quiero que actúen. Eh, de hecho en la teoría se suele... Eh, no está incorporada la libertad de las personas porque las acciones de las personas efectos de los contratos incompletos, de los mecanismos, qué sé yo. Entonces, mi pregunta es si es posible al final construir una sociedad democrática igualitaria si mantenemos esta perspectiva de si hacemos mejor este banco o mantenemos esta firma democrática sin incorporarnos en los movimientos populares que están peleando, digamos, para que los ricos entreguen el poder. Porque al fin y al cabo esto es una pregunta política el que, el que los que tienen el poder lo entreguen, no lo van a entregar porque es más eficiente, digamos. Entonces, en, en ese sentido... ¿Tiene sentido en sí misma la investigación sin compromiso político? ¿Si puede generar como consecuencia eh, investigaciones que son poco democráticas al final y que traen conclusiones poco democráticas y que, no nos, y que pueden generar efectos negativos para una sociedad mejor democrática, igualitaria y que, no sé, que las personas definamos sobre nuestro futuro libremente? Es como hablar un poco de ese tema. Thanks very much. Um, before, uh, before answering the question, Claudia, could you step out so we can thank you? No, 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 you have to show yourself. You die. Come on, step outside. <laughs> She's very shy. Anyway, we, we should thank her for the translations. Thanks. Uh, uh, there's, there's much that I agree with in your question, and there's some things that I don't. So let's start with the agreements. Of course, uh, uh, everything which I said will only come about because of political changes. Uh, I think those political changes are, are highly feasible today because of the vast inequalities from which people are suffering, large majorities in most countries, because we have democratic political procedures which can uh, uh, use the fact that a majority would benefit from an egalitarian program uh, to, I think, mobilize to make changes in that direction. I'm not at all pessimistic about that. Uh, I agree it's political, and I agree that the, the kinds of movements which we've seen in Chile over the last two years are absolutely essential to putting these questions forward in the public and to mobilizing people, eventually mobilizing the uh, full-time, you know, the people for whom politics is their day job. Uh, we need to mobilize uh, them, and uh, I think that, that can be done. The political commitments of the researcher. Uh, let me tell you a story. Um, when I use the word us in my research, I never refer to leftists as us. Never, never, never. Us, when I, in my research, is scientists. Seekers of knowledge, knowledge hunters. That's who I mean by us. Uh, I never exclude anyone because of their ideology, either as co-author or for any other reason. Uh, and I think I have, um, I've learned something in my life. That's a good strategy. I was fired by Harvard University for political reasons. And it became big news. The first communication which I got was a telephone call from the University of Chicago. A professor at the University of Chicago was calling me on the telephone and saying, sorry, you're in a little bit of trouble. I hope you fight them, and I hope you win. That wasn't the surprising part. What was surprising came next. He said, but if you decide, 
if you lose or if you decide you don't want to fight. You've got a job at the University of Chicago. I would have learned a lot if I'd gone to Chicago. I would have learned different stuff. I respect them immensely. I know it's hard to say in Chile because you have a very different perspective about people who came here with a political agenda. But I see a person like Gary Becker as a person from whom I can only learn however much I disagree with him, despite the fact that in a later time he tried to prevent me from getting a job. Uh, I didn't go to the University of Chicago because I did fight, I went to court, and I got my job back. Uh, but I learned that I have everything to learn from people whose politics I abhor. Uh, now, I'm not suggesting maybe I, if, in asking the question, of course I have a political commitment. You can just look at what I've written, look at what I'm interested in, look at the kinds of questions that I have asked. That comes from my hope for the world and for humanity. It's not the hope that Gary Becker has. We've studied different things. Uh, that's where it comes in. The questions that we ask, of course, differ tremendously. Uh, and I don't know, I think I'm maybe old enough so I can give advice to students. Uh, taking account of your political commitments is absolutely important. I mean, thinking about, does this excite me? Does this make me really feel excited? When I explain to my friend what I'm doing my research about, do I feel that sensation in your arm or that you really feel, wow, this is great? Uh, that's probably because of some moral commitments that you have, some ethical orientation towards your work that makes you feel, wow, if I could just get an answer to this, that would help somehow. I absolutely think that's important. You won't make it as an intellectual unless you feel that way. But when you write your stuff, you're writing for absolutely everybody because everybody can be converted. Almost everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much.